Dave here once again. Thank you very much for joining me for another edition of Bleeding Edge Interviews. Yes, I have been putting a lot out lately, and I'm very busy. <laughs> it's kept me quite busy. I hope you're enjoying them. Again, hey, the things are still kind of new here, but we're shaking it out pretty good, getting things settled down. If you've got any feedback constructive, of course, give me things to do more of, things to do less of, whatever. Suggestions are absolutely welcome. Meanwhile, I hope you enjoy it. This time around, I had the very distinct pleasure of speaking with Adam Elf, vocalist, guitarist, and songwriter for the band The Mommy Hits. They've been around for about 35 plus years, but a lot of their output has come in the last five years. And along with that has been their star on the rise. And it turns out, and I understand for Adam, this was even a little bit of a surprise for him. They're actually a little bit prop. Yes, they are. These things sneak up on us from time to time, and it's what happens, but it's very cool. And I've been very happy to be discovering them and falling down into their rabbit hole recently. And I think probably will be too. So... Without further ado, here is my conversation with Adam Elf, the band The Mommy Heads. Okay, nice to meet you, sir. Nice to meet you. Yeah, I'm glad you could join me this morning. Uh, it seems like it was fairly last minute we got this set up, so I know that sometimes is not easy, so I do appreciate your flexibility, and I'm glad I'm being, being able to do this with you. Yeah, I'm glad um, it's another day in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> practical people you know so yeah yeah my boss is often fond of saying if you can wake up in the morning you know who you are you know where you are and everything seems to work it's a good start to the day so yeah yeah totally excellent so uh you guys i have to admit um despite the fact that the mommy heads have been around for 30 plus years at this point in time um i've been behind the curve uh you guys snuck past me um so I have been doing a deep dive, getting to know all about the band as much as I can. Uh, you guys are incredibly productive. I got to say, <laughs> there's been a lot of yeah. <clears throat> pardon me, music that's come out. And I'm sitting there thinking, reading through the story of the Mommy Heads, uh, there, there's a lot there. And I think if there's a band I can think of in recent memory that really embodies the phrase, the long and winding road, it's the Mommy Heads. <laughs> and it seems at this point you're on the rise. So I'm curious, what are your thoughts about that? And tell us a little bit about the story and how we find ourselves here today now. Well, I think ri- rise is all relative. Um, I think with that, with help of some people around us, um, we're becoming more, pe- people are becoming more aware of us. We've never really been a band to make the a m- music to fit in to any one place that that has a larger audience you know if you want to get if you want to put out a movie and you you're in an amc theater chain people are going to go well what about that movie up there the one about the werewolf and the teenager you know we've never made a type of music we've seen a lot of them go past you know but we've never made we've always made the type of music that's been that that was made to fall into cracks because it has it, it has so much different things but nothing too strong um so we the grunge thing passed us by the new york uh, no uh like no wave thing passed us by the anti-acoustic thing uh the hip-hop white guy back thing you know it's like <laughs> even, and then by the time we broke up uh the uh, emo core came around and i met the guys from death cab and they were like yeah you were a big influence so we ended up being an influence out of time out of step wow. and the other thing is is we, we um the type of people we are we just we we like to make more than we like to tour now and and promote and and you have to get into people's sort of you have to break through their their outer crust and go hey you know <laughs> chisel through right. so um we had a brush with possible success in 97 we were on geffen and and I felt like when we had that brush and we were surrounded by AR people and um like we had two AR guys one had Peter Gabriel and and um, Amy Mann and and uh, Weezer and the other one had Guns N' Roses and you know it was just like star studded and yeah and we start I felt like anything we were writing or I was writing was worse because of the pressure of having a you know Peter Gabriel's A and R guy or or Guns N' Roses A and R guy 
meeting the president of Geffen, doing interviews with Billboard. Like I just felt the pressure of trying to all of a sudden fit in. And then I felt the music was terrible. So oh, well. we do our best when we're ignored. We're do our, we, and, and we are the deep dive band and what's happening to you is fine. <laughs> and it's how we're constructed. We, you, you find us and it's all of a sudden it's a little, you know, you uncover a rock and there's sunlight coming from the earth and you, how can there be sunlight down there? And you, all of a sudden it opens up more and you fall in. And then by the time you come out, you're like, that was pretty cool, you know? Yeah, right. And that's who we are. So it, it makes sense to me. Totally. You guys are the rabbit hole band, so to speak. <laughs> the ultimate rabbit hole band. Yeah. <laughs> and which is, of course, I'm curious too. I, I have to ask about the origin of the name. I think that's like part of it here. It's a very unusual name. And I got to think there's a story behind that. It's the worst. It's like, I was a teenager. I was in high school. I was a, maybe even a sophomore, just becoming a junior in high school, 17. We had a gig at CBGB's. We were so excited because I would go there. I was a rug rat. I saw yeah. all those bands play. Um, Tom Tom Club, Suicide, Ramones. Like I was the, the kid that snuck in. And I was with staying at my mom's place. And the other two names were worse. So it's just... The, the cool thing is also, if you could be in a band called the Mommy Heads, 35 years, <laughs> it shows a sign of confidence. <laughs> that, you know, you haven't changed it to something cool, like like Epic Journey or, or right. you know, uh, Sage. You know, something like one word, easy to remember. The cool thing I will say is, if you type Mommy Heads in, you just get us. Whereas if you type UK, looking, you, you have to type Bruford in. You have to type in... Um, you know, Wetton, because UK brings up a million things for UK and also Boston and Kansas. So we have, our name is so out there and uncool that it literally brings you right to us. Yeah. <laughs> so. You guys were way ahead of the curve in that term because it's, it's almost as if you intuited the eventual <laughs> rise of search engines and the internet and everything because <laughs> recent interviews I've done with young bands who just come out you know they made comments about intentionally picking a name or a spelling of a name that was easy to come up in the search engine you guys did it maybe before anything were born i don't that might be <laughs> it's out of idiocy it's out of not knowing and um you're right it is the ultimate search engine name uh and i think now that if fans try to do that they're still thinking they need to be cool. They're just yeah. compromising their process. Whereas we, we just did it out of pure not knowing. And so um, I could find search engine band names that are cooler than ours because they're still new. They, they still knew they had to try. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, it's funny though, but you guys were very prescient in that sense too. <laughs> Thank God um, we're prescient in some sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, honestly, looking at your catalog there, um, and I'm going to blank on the title of the album now, but I, I think a couple of years before the pandemic hit, uh, I got to pull it up. And Age, of Age of Isolation. Age of Isolation. You're in the midst of it. Where are we at here? Yeah. Uh, I hate to do this. Soundtrack for the World's End. There it is. Oh, it, God. It's almost as if you guys knew. <laughs> was, was that well, the prescient on your part or was that a matter of um, <laughs> you felt it was just as bad then as it is now? Yeah, well, the the only way we were musical fortune tellers was was really because we're older. We have kids, yeah. and the same way when my kids were born, I, I stopped watching horror films because I just couldn't take it, especially when they were like teenagers in it. Yeah. You have you have skin in the game for art, and you have to like sort of keep it light. Uh, we started as older songwriters. We became more cognizant of the fact that the planet is not growing and getting cleaner it's getting you know it's it's just going in the wrong direction and so in 2018 i i made my daughter wear an israeli gas mask and it looked like the end of the world it was very uh sort of um yeah like we're, we're heading toward towards i didn't know it was going to be COVID. i thought it would be yeah. more like forest fires and uh lack of drinking water and and the forest fire air thing made sense but covid was left field for everybody but for that to come out 2018 and then two years later we're wearing masks it's kind of spooky but i also think art should be that way you you can be ahead of your time or out of time saying right. things through emotional context uh 
th that you you know you're sort of the canary in the coal mine and you're basically going if we keep heading this like stop working with blinders and just making donuts and making widgets like let's open this up and and trust your gut and i think that's what a like uh decent songwriting or decent creativity should uh make a listen their listeners aware to and then you feel like hey you know um there's songwriters that seem like they're just fortune telling like dylan was for in the 60s or yeah. um i even find that with with john anderson um i know in, in that gobbledygook there's a lot of gorgeous future stuff and um and um that's what a good artist should do is is make you aware of stuff that you know but they're just saying it to you they're bringing it front and center you know it we all yeah. know this stuff you know so Forest fires. What's this insanity you're talking about? What? <laughs> Good. That's can't real. Happen. Yeah. It's back. <laughs> anyway. Um, and, and that's the interesting thing. Like you talk about being ahead of your time and things like that. I, I almost wonder if that's what needed to happen for the mommy heads, that, that the world has been catching up to you guys all this time and that you were merely there a little bit early. Although I guess there was recognition of that at the time, but it just sort of seems like you know, like all of a sudden now I'm going, you guys just, you're doing that slow rise. You're, you're slowly coming to prominence more and more. Um, it's almost like the time has, has finally come for you guys to, to break through. Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe we're kind of, we're a little past our prime in terms of energy, like how much mm -hmm. energy we, we can involve. And we have families and sure. we have day jobs. Thank God. I think because we have day jobs, because we don't try for hits, we don't want to be on necessarily on pop radio. Yeah. We don't need to have thousands of people in the audience that we have to win over. We'd ra rather win over 50 to 100 people. It's just easier for us. We don't have the energy right. for big shows and, and <laughs> big expectations. I think part of the secret to any success we have is the fact that we've had no success. And, and I always call us like mushrooms. You know, mushrooms are good for you. They're, they're a part of the ecosystem. They have a network that you take mushrooms away. It, it falls apart in terms of nature. Yeah. But they live under leaves and you don't discuss mushrooms. You, you look at roses when you walk into a nice field and some artists are roses and you, they immediately hit you back like Prince, Michael Jackson, Taylor Swift. They just knock you over. And then there are the mushroom bands that are part of the ecosystem like us and, and but don't need don't need adoration or, or instant gratification and and actually make better art when ignored, completely ignored. Mm -hmm. And then slowly, one person at a time goes, you know, this mushroom should be on a plate somewhere in a nice restaurant in Manhattan. Let's take it out of the shadows. Let's give it a name, an Italian name. Let's add it to the menu as the new star item. And all of a sudden, you know, and then, you know, what happens? Backlash, like tea tree oil. We, we was the biggest rage 20 years ago. I don't see it anymore. It was in shampoo for crying out loud. Then oh, wow. avocado was in shampoo. Like who wants to do that? I mean, if, if our mushroom brain of music is all of a sudden in every shampoo, then we, there's a backlash. Then it's like, yeah. I've heard them. I don't like them. You know, so <laughs> I'm almost afraid of success. I prefer the one at a time where there's ownership and, you know, they're like, yeah, I saw them live. It was really good. I like that one record and I think they should keep going, you know? Right. There's a certain freedom that comes with that. I imagine as well. The fact that one, you, as you mentioned, you've got day jobs, so you don't need to do this. You're doing this because it's what you want to do. And there's that absence of the pressure that comes with big success because then you're expected to be big success every single time. It happened. It happened. It happens to bands all the time. They get signed to major labels. I, I bring up Death Cab again. They get signed to Columbia. And I think things changed a little. They got more poppy. Right. I, you know, if, if, if people, everybody wants to dance, let's right. admit it. Some of us are not good, right? Or, or we're, <laughs> We're too skinny, too fat, too tall, too short. And we put the beautiful dancers on Carnegie Hall and, and, and Lincoln Center. And then the rest of us, if we turn the light switches off and dance in the dark, we're amazing. So um, we're just trying to dance in the dark as much as possible to make the art. And, and if people want to, like, you know, come into the room and dance with us, great. And that's yeah. it's been working for us. And I love doing interviews like this. And I, and I love playing intimate gigs. And yeah. um I just have a fear. I do have a fear of success. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to not accept it or not want it to some degree right. because I think I see everyone else wanting it. I just don't know yeah. if it works for us as best to make what our kind of music. So I, it's specific. 
desire not to crave it too hard. Yeah. Gotcha. I, I, side note here. I, I, I love your metaphors. I, I like to work a lot <laughs> in metaphors, lyricist. what I do. And they're, they're yeah. brilliant. They're perfect. And I, I, I'm digging it. So it, it's when I look or back and I can see too, especially for you guys, like I know there was that long break. Um, and then you got back together and made a couple of albums. And then like around 2018, 2017, give or take, boom, 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 boom. You just been cranking them out. Yeah. Is, is, what is that? Is this just a burst of creativity in the moment? That's, that's, that's uh, got you generating all these things. Cause like, this is like King gizzard, wizard, lizard level. I know. Like, it's amazing that people can do that so swiftly or, or over all those years, did you end up having a lot of material that you're just now getting around to recording? Um, okay. There's a couple of factors. We got back together in a way because our first drummer, our high school drummer from the first two records passed away. Yeah. It's very sad. So we had a reunion concert and reality hit us. And then we were like, Hey, we love playing together. And that was 08 to 2012. We were functional. And then, uh, in, 2012 i had to start my a new business and so i was very concrete i'm going to give five years of my uh, attention to this new business so it is a success and i did that and i asked the band to put it on hold yeah. and five years later to the day i said you ready you know and and so it was very very um it was a formula and i tried to stick to it and then we made a soundtrack to the world's end which was kind of dark and different and brooding and we have like there's some like almost metal on there. Like the last mm. song um, is kind of like deep purple metal. And we had such a blast that we were like, well, let's do another one. And then reality keeps hitting. Like um, we had our a bass player we worked with in San Francisco that played on two songs, Rick Wilson, who passed away recently. And then it just, we're like, wow, you know, we're, if there's one thing we know how to do is make this music, it's relatively effortless to make deep, heavy, feeling music yeah. um for a lot of other bands making um just you know like drinking rock or you know music to pick up the opposite sex by or whatever like they'll that that's for them but to make sort of progressive intricate very uh like uh intensely deep lit with layers to the lyrics and you know progressive pop baroque stuff like it's very effortless for us. So if it's so effortless, why don't we continue? Because we're not getting younger and we're kind of dropping, like not to be blunt, like we lost two members, you know, even yeah. though they only play, it, they're not longstanding members. You know, there's a fear of mortality and you want to get it all out and you want to um, do as much as possible. And the last thing is I worked in museums. I met my wife at a museum when I was in my 20s. And, and, and the water lilies, came out when he was in his eighties or ninety. I mean, he was old and right. his eyes were starting to go. And that's why the water lilies are blurred. And to me, they're some of the best work he's ever done. Monet. And, yeah, yeah. um, and I've thought, how is this some of the best art? And, you know, you see this with writers, like they'll in their seventies, they'll go into a cabin in the woods and write three amazing novels, some of their best work, and it'll be mature and deep and you'll relate to it because you're mature. And you're, you know, you're not a 20 year old reading Jack Kerouac anymore. You're reading some very heavy, you know, this person's been through a lot. And between that and the Monet water lilies where he's got glaucoma and he's, you know, why can't we make music? Why is it a young person's game only? We're just going to make a different version of this. It's going to be deeper and it's going to have more wisdom to it. And so, and then the last thing is, is I just am a compulsive writer. And I, if I say, we're going to like, let's say November, we're going to make a new record. I tend to like get people to come to the studio. I, I, I'm the smelling salts in the band and, um, <laughs> and combine it all. Like we're not complaining. We're totally yeah, into yeah. it. And the last three, I think have been our strongest records and, and that for us, and that's a good sign Yeah, to feel that way. Yeah. I, I, I can really hear the shift from early on till now. Cause you know, a lot of your earlier stuff was right at home with, late eighties, nineties, indie, you know, college radio. Um, and it was really good. And then I listened to this newer stuff and I'm hearing these extra layers of influences, you know, whether it be kind of a blues rock or funk 
or as you noted, progressive elements and things like that, you know, like listening to Coney Island kid, you know, and, and you got strings layered with a bit of synth and things like that. And there's an extra lushness, but it's still you guys like you haven't changed massively, but the growth and the layers are apparent at the same time. It's been a subtle, you know, little bit of addition here and there, you know, it's almost like, you know, you start off with a house and now I'm going to go with metaphors. You start off with a house, you know, and you initially put, <laughs> put the stuff in the house and the furniture. And then little by little, you add little personal items and details until it's a home. And that's, I've used that same metaphor. I've used that same metaphor. I've used the same metaphor. Well, Beautiful. the reason why bands earlier work and some of it's innocent, like you listen to early Beatles and it's just beautifully innocent. They yeah. want just, they just want to hold your hand. Right. It's all they want to do. Right. But, and I see that as like a ranch house with, you can't have a basement. It's, it's on sand. You can't have an attic because there's, there's weight restrictions. And, and then as you get older and, and you're doing like, I am the walrus, you got a basement, you got an attic, you got side rooms, you got dormers, you got, some of it's haunted. You know, you, it's, I think the big difference is we didn't even know we were singing about or why we were playing. Um, you don't know what drives you. You just, you're, you're good at your guitar. So you're going to play in a band, you know? Um, and and the the other thing is is you're self conscious, mm -hmm. and and you care about what you're going to wear. Should I wear the cowboy boots or the biker boots to the to the gig? Should I my hair be parted on the left or right? Everything matters. And so, yeah. being you know, I see this with my kids. Like every every you're worried about your peers and what they think. When you get into your 30s, 40s, 50s, you could walk around with a pizza stain all day long, huge, <laughs> and not care. Because you know who you are, you know who your friends are. They're going to dismiss the pizza stain, um, and it's that way with the music. And I see this in my favorite bands too. I love their earlier work, but I also want to know what they did later because I really feel like they knew who they are as people. They've had their breakdowns. They've had failed marriages. They've had successful marriages. They've been bad parents at some points and good point good parents at some points right they've gone through that cycle they've gone down the path they know where the calluses are on their feet on their hands they just know who they are they know what their allergies are and in terms of music it's the same and so we yeah. can make a record that feels lush and is and is but is actually simple yeah it has both it's not just drenched in reverb but but it's actually the reverb pops in and out and it heightens certain lyrics Right. And and then it goes back to small to heighten those small lyrics that needs your needs your attention in an intimate way. And then one feels, you know, <clears throat> that's pr that's what production wisdom to not just go. I don't like reverb. I don't like delay. I just <laughs> distort my guitar. I play with drop D tuning all the time. Like, no, yeah. you do whatever serves the music. Yeah. And and and, uh, you know, I know that you this is your this is a, you know, mostly prog dedicated. My problem with a lot of prog bands is they feel they must rock out all the time. Like, right. do a ballad or, or, or play an acoustic guitar on a song. You'll bring me in more to push yeah. me away. And my favorite bands, whether it's prog or not, do it all. So, you know, mm -hmm. that would be Beatles, Kinks, uh, Yes, King Crimson. It doesn't matter to me. Right. It could be anything. It could be Scriabin, as long as it... Uh, as that it's not one thing and that just because you had a photo shoot 30 years ago with leather doesn't mean you need to keep wearing that same leather outfit you can do whatever you want to do and that you know that's just wisdom and and not buying into your own mystique like oh we created this image that's what people want no they don't they don't care they want you to be happy yeah you know? and that's i think the funny thing that people sometimes lose in the idea of prog progressive is that it's not there's like I, i've sometimes have bumped up against the phrase traditional prog which is an oxymoron in my mind and, and i think gram grammatically it is so it's not just me and that some bands get caught in that idea of here's our template here's what we do when it's a matter of if you want to be progressive just keep pushing your boundaries keep exploring outside of what you've been doing and keep doing something different that's progressive so it might be 15 minute songs but it doesn't have to be sometimes it's perfectly fine to be a three and a half minute pop song you know sometimes it's perfectly fine to to like you said pull out the acoustics and make a ballad versus 
hey, let's see how long I can noodle as fast as I can with my keyboard or my guitar until you know my audience has fallen asleep because we're waiting for the melody to return. <laughs> like I love the noodling. I love a musical um, virtuosity. Yeah, and at the at the same time, the end is always the song product is what matters. Oh my god! Oh my god! Look, I mean, <clears throat> New Prague. Look, I love the concept of progressive. We were always okay. called progressive. I didn't fully accept it until we made it to Sweden, and we hang with guys there that are literally the top progressive writers in the world that tell us we're Prague. Wow! They 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 hold the mirror up and they go, you know, you're really more early Genesis than you think you are. <laughs> um, so it wasn't until we had people tell us and give us perspective, yeah. we thought we were a pop band. To me, I love the concept of Prague, and I love early Prague, not bec- for the only reason that it wasn't invented yet. And all it was yeah. was, let's try it. Let's do a whole side of a record. Let's do the knife. Right. Let's do, um, and even within three minute songs, like to me, the Kinks get pro- progressive. Um, the Who got progressive. Early Who got progressive. It was still right. conceptual, and who you know. Um, Prague is anything to me that uh, pushes boundaries, just like you said. I do love when bands finally give in to the fact that they have to learn to play their instruments, and and that does help them <laughs> venture into these new places. Right. It's hard to sustain attention for 10, 20 minutes without great playing. Let's be honest. If right. you're just jangling, you want it over in two minutes. So there needs to be some proficiency. But I lost a lot of new Prague, I'll be honest, and I don't want to name names. And some of them have even said that they are fans of ours. Um, but I do get lost in excessive noodling without a song. And I get lost when bands do compartmentalize and say, now we're doing our tribute record to this band. Or, you know, because, yes, there was no music like Yes when they started. They were in uncharted territories, so it still sounds fresh. But when you make a record that sounds like Yes or sounds like Channel Giant, um, you're constricted by what they've accomplished. They've right. set the boundaries up. And it's it's just like watching it's like watching another Olympics and right. you know who the best is, and here are all these other people trying to be the best. Yeah. When you know there's only one Pele and there's one, you know. And, and yeah. when they add new things like competitive um, you know, uh, log rolling. Then I get excited because then we start over. It's fresh yeah. or com- competitive, um, you know, um, like people slapping each other. It's in it's in the Olympics now. <laughs> Who's going to stand? You know, then I'm like, oh, we're starting fresh. It's like, yes, in 69, going to see King Crimson, getting inspired and going, we need a Chamberlain and let's do this. and let-. So that's what I love. Freshness. Right, right. And I think a lot of new Prague is not fresh and they focus on noodling over songs. And there's very few that I go, oh man, they're t- this is real progression, progressiveness. Yeah. So, yeah, I completely agree. I, I, <clears throat> I can think in a certain context, one of the more recent ones that, that has popped into the progress sphere, as I like to call it, kind of uh, unintentionally, just as, as you guys did, uh, is Jason Beeler. Now, here he was back in the late 80s, 90s, making music with Saigon Kick that was essentially characterized as, as hair metal. And then somewhere along the line, he he does an album and just basically does whatever he wanted, you know, all over the place, throws in the kitchen sink here and there and does a few different things. And all of a sudden he wakes up one day and goes, what the hell, I'm suddenly prog. I love that. Like, like I love when it happens to you like a virus. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I really agree. I woke up one day. I was like, I think I'm prog, hon. You know? yeah. <laughs> it's, it's weird. It just, should be that way. Yeah. Yeah, and it that's a, be a because, all, because he followed his muse, like you guys have done. You followed your muse, you did what you wanted, and you weren't afraid of of going outside of the lines a little bit. And suddenly you're prog, and there you go. To me, that that's the perfect way to find your way there by accident. And the ultimate thing you realize when doing it is no one really cares out there. Like, yeah, it's not going to affect anyone. The only person right. that you're worried about too much is yourself. Yeah. And if you can get it past yourself, you're doing great. Um, some, some bands that I've listened to recently that, that have blown me away, Slugfest from Brooklyn, mm. a band called Slugfest, uh, just young guy with vintage keyboards. I love vintage keyboards. Nice. As you can tell, I've got some arps and stuff. <laughs> yeah, um, a few. Horse Lords don't song, but they have King Crimson 
three over four thing like they just yeah if you're in if you're a drummer and you want to hear a band play like five drummers in a drum circle and in, in different rooms it's crazy right. horse lord oh wow beautiful. um once in future band from oakland they're the closest thing i've heard to us it, it could be michael mcdonald one second and then it could be total steely dan jam extended jam where what they do in in the rehearsal space kind of jam right. um okay. i'm going back and yes, writing these down <laughs> I'll send you a list. You know, Juana Molina okay. from Argentina is great. She's incredible. Right. Um, but I, I don't, I don't necessarily listen to the, the bands that drop detuning and jung, 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 brrr, right. you know, I, I'm too much of a song guy. Um, gotcha. but there are moments, there are definitely moments. And when I go to Sweden, we hang out with the Prague people. They love Opeth. They right. love, you know, all those bands, uh, big, big game. Gregory plays in Big Big Train from XTC. I love Dave Gregory. So there's a lot of mutual sort of hanging out, drinking yeah. a whiskey at three in the morning, talking shop and listening to this stuff. And I appreciate it. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice. Let's yeah. talk about the new album a little bit because we haven't even gotten to that yet. Um, <clears throat> and I'm hoping you got the time for it. <laughs> I've, yeah, we're, we're leaving on tour for Sweden um, today in like three hours. Oh, no Wow. Okay. Band showing right. up after, an hour after us, but let's let's go all the way to eleven. I'm I'm good. Beautiful. Okay. Yeah. Um, so tell me a little bit about the themes that you were exploring in this album. What what were your inspirations that that got you to Coney Island Kid? So I f I fear the concept record like anyone else. I think there are th yeah. three or four good ones. Tommy and Lamb lies down, and and even Lamb, you're not sure where you are half the time. And right. Um, Quadrophenia, but you know, 15th record, it's an idea. And I wrote three or four songs that did stem from my childhood in Coney Island. I think anyone who grows up anywhere has a rebellion against where they grew up. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. Some people go back when they, they want a family and they're like, I love it. I miss my, my parents and they have the right values in my town. You know, for me, it was Coney Island. I have a very intense memory bank about it that when i think about it it's just it feels like a progressive lyric mm -hmm. so i started jotting notes down and that became coney allen kid uh and it's uh, it's not the it's not like the poster child happy lyrics come visit coney allen it, uh, to me it's a very dystopian place it's an urban amusement park beach so you have like 10 million people and where do they go to let off steam is coney allen's you know, I love the Warriors growing up. I saw them film the scene with the bottles come out to play. Right. I, my dad had a place in the boardwalk. He still lives there. So that all came out. It's in five, eight. It's very akin to what well, back in New York from Genesis. It has that relentless, just beat down. And then uh, artificial Island was about Robert Moses. I'm in a domain, just plowing through neighborhoods with highways and building projects on, you know, these ugly projects giving you the false sense of the future, which is right. we have a wash a, a room full of dryers and washers. It's paradise. We have communal playgrounds, not unlike Russia. If you're around Moscow or Leningrad, you know, these <laughs> huge, you're in China, you know? And so he, he did that and he was a parks commissioner. They couldn't get rid of him because he also made open spaces. So yeah. that's the second song. The, the, the third song is about Spookorama, a place where I used to go. My sister went there. It was a fun house. It was so old that it was scary, similar to the cyclone, right. where the ricketiness of it, you feel like you're going to die from that, not from the design. It's just creaking. Yeah, um, yeah. And that's about that. And I made up scenarios about my dad who worked on the cyclone and my mom would bump, mop the floor, floors at the, at the um, bumper cars. And, the, um, and it just keeps going down this road. The, the, the fourth song is about um, called Solemn by the Sea, which is Sodom by the Sea. It was a twist on words and it was about a hundred years ago when there were fires dreamland would burn down and um the last song is souls aquarium the, the aquarium is in coney island like you have to go all the way out there to see fish the irony is they put the fish right near the ocean so the fish are looking at the ocean going i'd rather be there and so that song souls yeah. aquarium is about fish you know and then the fish want to be in the ocean the people are there seeing fish thinking they're free but are we really free so it gets into this whole deep you know and it ended up we started to interlace the sound design between the songs and they weave together 
Mm -hmm. Um, And it became a concept record about Coney Island and about just kind of growing up in a place that you're, you have very strong feelings for, like, which we all do. And, um, and the band jumped on board hundred percent. And it was awesome. It really is to hear, you know, this, this, this sentiment in a record is pretty, is really cool. Similar to Quadrophenia, it's about mod kids fighting rockers like the who. So yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I had the question in my head about the album covers. So I think you now answered that because I was going to say, you know, I've never been to Coney Island. I'm not from that area, but you know, was always familiar. It's supposed to be a fun place. And I'm going, yeah, that album cover does not say fun to me. That album cover says, Oh dear God, help me. I'm going to hell. And so I think you pretty much said it clearly. Kudos to the album cover designer. They nailed the concept perfectly. Oh, he's Swedish. Everybody's Swedish in our world. So yeah, he's awesome. This guy, Mark, he's incredible. Yeah, that, that's it. Nailed it perfectly. All right. Um, and I was kind of curious because I don't know, is, is Coney Island Kid an old metaphor or, or expression? I, I tried to Google that. Google was not very helpful in, in clearing that up for me. We're, we're really good at ungoogleable <laughs> lines. Mommy heads, Coney Island Kid. No, I mean, we're trying to be original. Same yeah. with Genius Killer, the record okay. before, Age of Isolation. You can't right. Google that. I think it's an amazing line, Age of Isolation. Yeah, It's just trying to be, trying to be different, A, which I guess we are right. a little self-conscious, but it was trying to say something in a way where you got it immediately. Yeah. Who is this Coney Island kid? Who's this kid on the cover? Right, Why right. does he look uh, unsure about going into this fun house or horror house? And um, ironically, I, I think that does help everything stand out. Like when I see yeah. record covers called like, like generic titles, like be here now or yeah. going with you know going with the flow like i'm like is it country is it mm-hmm. is it like meditation massage music i like the title to really help you conjure up the imagery before you even get there um yeah. and not be too amb- ambiguous and uh it, it just helps in this day and age of inundation we're all inundated it's like oh okay um i get that so yeah yeah no no i like the way because it it is a phrase that immediately sounds familiar and yet at the same time is not like that. This isn't something you pulled out from somewhere else. This is something you created that had immediate sense of familiarity and hearing the themes and the concepts behind the album as just layers of depth, which, which I love that, that depth of thinking that went into it. Um, that I'm certain becomes very clear when one has like, you know, the lyrics and gets to hear them and all that, um, you know, and, and so that's to me, one of those lost arts in many ways. Not everybody is really good at that. Yeah. I obsess over tight. I love the three minute pop song. I love tight, concise concepts. Yeah. Definitely for titles. Um, it really helps. And again, I'll repeat in this age of inundation and confusion, where, right. do, where is my information coming from? What can I trust to get something that sounds familiar and concise and original is very hard to do. Yeah. Um, and I obsess over it as much as trying to name your own kid. Like you'll go over a thousand names with your, your better half. Timmy, yeah. Tommy, to be everything makes you think of something. <laughs> That's what lyricists obsess over because yeah. You find that name for your kid that you're that they're going to live with forever. And you're going to live with forever. That doesn't have a reference to your life that you can't stand. Oh no, my first boyfriend was named Timmy. No, 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 Tommy. No, that was my that accountant that screwed me up. Like you finally find that one name that works that has no references that upset you, and that to me is a song titles I obsess over. Album titles, definitely courses. Yeah. I want it to feel a little familiar. You know, you don't want to walk into an you don't want your kid to walk into an interview and go, my name's exacerbated. You know, you want him to walk in and go, John, you know, <laughs> you don't want him to you don't want someone to go out, get out of my office. So you want but but John may not be right. So it may be Juan or it may be John with J O N or so yeah. you really every song for me, and I'm not an obsessive in most areas, but when it comes to like wording 
and what that what one word can do it's important it really is yeah yeah yeah, yeah you're not, <laughs> you're not wrong there it's a big deal and and that yeah. level of craftsmanship comes across when somebody is putting that level of effort into it um, it's effort more than talent i must say <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to think it's usually a mix of both. Uh, uh, thank you. But, <laughs> yeah. So, and, and speaking of that and meanings and all that, especially the first single, uh, Why Aren't You Smiling? And I'm hoping I got that right. Because again, going to my memory, which sometimes mixes words up. But it, my initial run through hearing it, my first thinking was along the lines of um kind of almost this female perspective on misogyny where you've got men telling women to smile or you should smile more, blah, blah, blah. That's kind of what I was hearing. But again, it was like my first couple run throughs in the song and I'm still picking up on the lyrics, but I think there's some other meanings behind that as well. Or, or was that it? Cause now I'm sitting there thinking, well, you're at Coney Island. Why aren't you smiling and having fun? Were you kidding? <laughs> it did fit, but yeah. it was the most loosely fit song on the record, but you're totally right. It is about, how society's set up. You know, I just had this like really intense conversation with my wife this morning and we came to this conclusion that I get a, too much of my negativity out through song and there's not enough left for the relationship. <laughs> and I'm too, I'm too much of an optimist because I've, I have such a, my processing tool is, is so um, or, organized and well oiled. Yeah. She's like, you're not bringing enough realism to us. We need to work on this. And I'm like, you're right. And that actually was a, almost another metaphor for Why Aren't You Smiling, which is, I personally feel in society, you can go in with a resume that's stacked. Yale University, worked at, you know, whatever, like all the right places. But if you're a downer in the interview, it's all about who you are. Yeah. They want to know if they're going to want to spend every, you know, moment of the day with you at, at a job or even on Zoom. If you're a drag to work with, you're kind of out. And so this is a sort of base animal reaction we have between each other um, and how we accept each other and how we, the hierarchy of people in, in society. And yeah. especially has always not, it, I think women were taught to smile forever. Whereas guys are doers and whatever, you know, the, the masculine thing is, you know, you're tough. You know, there, I've met some, I know guys like my dad never said a word to me. I'm like, what? You know, so. Or never had a meaningful conversation yeah. or my, my dad's grandparents didn't want to talk about the war. They didn't want to tell them a huge part of their life. Like all these. Right. So men are taught to hold back and, and, or at least traditionally. And so, but I think in society now, especially with zoom and, and everything's facial, you know, we don't get to have a beer and pass out in each other's arms where it's always on stand, sitting. And yeah. so, yeah, I think a positive out, you know, appearance is so important and that's what that song questions especially yeah. at amusement park for sure yeah well, the superficiality Timmy, you of it all. Time? you're finally yeah. at coney island smile more <laughs> it's like mm. i don't want it the place is scary <laughs> it's too scary this is awful i smell <laughs> urine all the time <laughs> yes urine is not part of the fun experience and and there's this guy selling white stuff in a packet like get me out of here like yeah I was again, out. I don't want to judge anybody's kink. Maybe urine is part of the fun experience. I don't know. It's not for me. Urine and crack. <laughs> yes. Urine and crack. There we go. And hot dogs. That's New York. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It reminds me of an old Letterman introduction on his show. <laughs> They're all back great. Before, yeah, they were. Back back before 9-11 when he was happy to make fun of it and then stopped. Because I don't blame him at that point in time. I think I would have stopped as well. He was so great. But, yeah. Yes. Yes, he was. <laughs> and he still is. Uh, he He's just doesn't great. do what he used to do. Yeah. yeah. Um, literally one of the guys that inspired me to get into broadcasting oriented stuff. One of the two. Very just middle America meets stars. Tear him down. Yeah. I'm from yep, Indianapolis. Absolutely. You can't pull that with me. Just that no. says it all. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, I'm curious because I mean, at this point in time, it, it seems like you guys have the album production process. I imagine down to a science at the rate you're you're cranking them out, and at the same time, I recognize that I guess every album has its challenges um, or 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 road bumps. Um, what about this one this time around? What challenges did you encounter? Well, 
you know, we we have this. We our original lineup has a keyboardist, Michael Holt, but he's taking care of his 104 year old dad in Cape Cod. Oh wow! The big challenge was getting him down from Cape Cod. He doesn't tour with us anymore. He just can't. Yeah. So he's a caregiver, and his mom's in her 80s. And we had Jackie Simon sit in, who I worked with, who's who's 32, 33. So that was fine, but the challenge of one challenge was just trying to get everyone in the same room. And there was yeah. COVID. So age of isolation and genius killer, we were masked up and it was tough. It's hard to yeah, sing yeah. through a mask. And um, I will say uh, the other, one other challenge is, um, you know, we're all obsessed with making music and this type of music. And so it puts challenges on our families. I, it, it's just going on tour. I'm missing my kids first day of school. Those, those mm-hmm. things really are tough. Um, but on a musical standpoint, there's, it's just really just flows out and I'm fortunate for that. I'm fortunate to, so fortunate to have this place, this, this, this one safe place that, uh, on an artistic level and a spiritual level is just free, free flowing. And the way we play together, I've been playing with the drummer since the late eighties, um, the bass player since the late nineties. It there really don't there's not you don't need to force anything. We just will fight. It's fine. Everything's fine because the end result is we get to make music that we're proud of, so proud yeah. of that stands up against any anything else in our record collection for us. Right, right. And that's so big. It's it really sucks for a band to feel like they're making substandard music, and they would be embarrassed to see their record amongst their their uh, other records in their collection of their heroes or their friends' bands. If they're so embarrassed, they refuse to even put it up. You know, to have it up in that is in that um, echelon. Just personally, feels really good. That if, yeah. if it's the sound quality, not even the writing, or if it's the drum sound, whatever it is, and that's really cool. It, and and that's a very safe place for a bunch of guys. We could be in a bowling league. We could be golfers. Yeah. We just happen to be in a progressive baroque pop band. Yeah. You know. I have to chuckle to myself a little bit too, because I know I'm sure you've heard of Steven Wilson, right? Who has not oh, at yeah. this point in time, maybe. And and he's talked about his last few solo albums wanting to pull in that that progressive pop element that he remembers from the eighties and things like that. And at the same time, I hear you guys have been doing it. So that you were well, that's kind all of we know how to do. I think Steven is Steven uh, Steven and I share the same um press agent, Ken right. Weinstein. Oh, I no, think Ken. Steven's probably, you know, Ken? Yeah. I, I do not know. It's oh, an okay. interesting small world that way. Well, it's funny because Ken had to do his last record or last two records and they were, they were more accessible. And yeah. Ken was asking me like, you know, what do you think of this approach? Da, da, da. And I'm like, sounds good. You know, and he was yeah. proud of how they approached the pitchforks over the prog magazine, you know, trying to twist it so that it's more accessible. I think Steven probably is t- un- talented enough and focused yeah. enough <clears throat> and balanced in, in his approach and, and calmly balanced to do whatever he wants to do. Sure. I don't think we have that ability. We know how to do this. Um, and we're satisfied with doing this one thing. Well, I think, you know, Steven's a mastering engineer and yeah. has rapport with Jethro Tull and XTC and, and can follow his muse a lot easier. I think than we can out of this, range that we're in this yeah, range yeah. and that's fine um and that's why we need guys like steven to remaster xtc records because it's we need new generations to know about it it's so yeah, important yeah. steven literally if he just brought that music back and remastered it and said to 20 year olds check this out right. that would be good yeah. enough without porcupine trick so we don't have that time or, or ability to, to even, you know, to do multitasking like that. So I'm appreciative yeah. of guys like that. Yeah. Well, yeah. The, the groove you guys are in, I don't see much reason to get out of it at this particular moment because, you know, again, I'll admit I'm a newcomer, but coming in and listening to these most recent albums, I'm going, wow. Like, you know, the, the, it, it's they're all solid and yet each one seems to just take another step beyond the last one you know and it, i i've walked away really impressed so i i'm looking forward to getting more and more familiar with it 
And I'm glad there's somebody out there doing that. You know, it, it's one thing I really, really admire in a lot of bands that are oftentimes my favorite is, is having a very unique voice. I don't mean singing voice. Of course, I mean their overall sound, their presentation, that they are bringing something that is immediately not really like anything else, that you can know it's them right from the start. And, and that's this blend of, of, of indie and rock and progressive that you guys are, are putting out right now. I'm going, this is a unique voice out there in the music world. And damn, I'm sorry I took me this long to catch on. Listen, <clears throat> I found out about early Genesis 10 years ago. I only knew Abacab Duke and <laughs> it wasn't until we got to Sweden and the, our buddy Anders, who basically if, if Genesis comes to Sweden, he, they have him on speed dial to do the interview. Right. Nice. He said to, uh, to me, you know, you should get into lamb and, and uh, you know, uh, selling in England by the pound. I found them in my forties that wow. the Peter Gabriel version. So I know where you're at. Time yeah. is foldable. Yeah. It, time has no meaning. If you get to a place, you get there. You may not yeah. be ready for certain things. I may not. I don't think I was ready for Lamb in my 20s. I don't think it would have made sense to me mm. because I thought I was this other person and I was very restricted by those thoughts. And as I got older and the, the, the barriers melted, I can take in that kind of intense creativity and all those interstitial pieces of music between the songs. I mean, I love it all. And I, I don't think I would have loved it all back you know, in my Abacab days because they're two radically different bands. So I totally get it. And all I could say is tell your friends, the ones that you think would jive with this kind of music. Um, yeah. But, but, um, and the best thing is and from just talking to you is you're open and, and you're open to be blown away by things. And I am too. And that's like, if someone plays us on the college radio, I'll look at the playlist and see who else they played. And I'll, right. and I'll like, selfishly see who was before and after because they some some synapse got triggered to play another band near us and i i think i'm gonna like it and then i oh 99 of the time i'll play those two bands that we were sandwiched between and they're great and they're young they're like 19 year old band from des moines and that's how i find our music because i am riding i'm i'm like saddling up on someone else's synapses trying to ride on their sort of like inspiration and the fact that I've let myself be open to that means that I've grown as a human, that I'm an open human being, and that my life is a little deeper and more fulfilled than I think it probably ever could be. And that's through music. It's through yeah. being inspired by music and, and uh, creativity. And if I didn't have that in my life, I would be someone else. But I want to think I wouldn't be as um, happy. Right. I get that. I get that. You know, so the fact that we're coming to you at now is great. And yeah. the fact that we're doing this is great. And, and, yeah. and I can only hope to have that, you know, going forward. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I certainly hope so. Um, real quick. Cause I know time can get a little short on us tour. Is there a tour coming up for you guys? Will we expect to see you on the road? Yeah. So we're hitting Sweden for 10 shows, um, in 10 days starting tomorrow. <laughs> we're flying today. Uh, so anybody in Sweden that, you know, tell them, tell them to come out. They can go to our Facebook. Oh, by the way, you find us at, uh, for music band camp, mommy heads is great. Band camp Fridays, yeah. all of it goes to us. It's better than anything beautiful out there. Patreon, you could pay a dollar a month. We'll send you new st songs and videos. And if you want to be in our or orbit, so Patreon's nice. great dollar a month. Nice. Um, and then uh, we come back here and we only have enough energy left in our 50 something year old bodies to, to play five shows, six shows. We're playing Catskill, New York, uh, Boston, which is sold out, which is great. Um, Philly, D.C. and Ooh. Beacon, New York. So we oh, have when are you in Philly. We're in Philly on um, Saturday, September 24th. It's that Saturday. It's in Glenside, Glenside at the Royal. Oh, it's Kendrick. a great new club that's amazing oh, it's owned by a drummer she's amazing oh oh wow that's amazing it's the best vibe ever you know if, if i can get there we'll get there we'll have to see we've got a wedding Where are you the day before i'm in south jersey so oh Glenn great Clyde we know well because the keswick theater is there where a lot of bands will play that we see so this yeah this woman is amazing bridget she she's a drummer she this club went into business she took it over 
You show up, she's like, what can I do for you? Nice. She obsesses over the sound. She toasts. Everyone has to get in a circle and toast to the, to the show. All artists. She, your merch, she sets it up for you. It's like, you, it's so not normal club activity behavior where yeah. it's all about who can you bring and I hate you. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> It's more like, I love, if you put on a good show, you, I love you forever. And yeah. um, it's her two-year anniversary show. She's Beautiful. made it to two years, so nice yeah. okay and it sounds good you know yes that's what you want right mm -hmm. <laughs> in the end that's what you want right all right well adam it has it has been my absolute pleasure to talk with you today and meet you and absolutely my pleasure to get to know the mommy heads uh, i really thank you for your time today i appreciate what you're doing keep doing it and uh it's awesome this is great i love it we'll I'm be back Absolutely. Yeah. Very good. I'm glad to look forward to that as well, because I can expect that'll probably be next year when your next album comes out. <laughs> could be could be like next month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, I'll just make it a week. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you guys, safe trip uh, in Sweden. I hope the shows go great. And I hope the shows back here go great. If I can make it out to uh, the Glenside show, I will be there. But in the meantime, best wishes. I hope the album's a big success. And I hope the tour is a big success for you. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Appreciate Thank you. you. Take care. Well, very happy to say that was just another in a string of great conversations I've had with people out there making some great music. Adam was a delight to talk to, as I'm sure you found out if you've gotten this far watching it. Adam, I just want to say thank you once again for your time. I, I wish you and the rest of the Mommy Heads nothing but success with the album and the tour. Fingers crossed I'm going to get to see you guys, hopefully in the near future, but I know the people that are going to be seeing you, uh, I have a feeling they're going to really enjoy what's going on. So thank you once again for joining me on Bleeding Edge Interviews. Meanwhile, let me remind the rest of you, hey, I got a backlog of other interviews available in podcast form. You can find that wherever you get podcasts. This one will be coming out in that eventually, as soon as we get a few things worked out details-wise. Meanwhile, check me out on the socials. You can find Bleeding Edge on Twitter, X, or whatever it's called, Facebook, Instagram, and Threads uh, with various permutations of the name. Just look in the description below. Hey, you might want to check out a little thing on Live 365 called The Expanse. Get your fill of Prague on a daily basis right there. And we're talking about the old stuff, the new stuff, everything in between. Hey, and, and if you're feeling so inclined, give me a like. I know how you do that. Yeah, everybody knows about that. <laughs> give me a like, but I'm going to beg for it nonetheless. Give me a like. Give me a subscription. Hit the little bell so that you know when new stuff is coming out because my schedule will tend to be inconsistent because, hey, it depends on when I can land some interviews. And it's a lot of work that goes into that. And in the end, I'm a one-man show putting all this content out. So I'm doing my best. Appreciate a little bit of support from you guys when you can give it to me. And then and in the meantime, all I can say is one, gonna be away for a couple of weeks, gonna be on vacation. So you'll have to do without me until mid-September. You'll be fine. Trust me. Breathe. It's okay. But when I get back, we'll be more interviews coming out as quickly as I can get them out. And then meanwhile, keep it proggy. Don't be afraid to deviate from the norm. And this is Super Dave signing off.